So many people have been interested in studying short-term memory um, over, over the many decades of, of um, psychologists studying memory and neuroscientists studying memory. And part of the reason for distinguishing short-term memory or working memory from long-term memory um, came from the, the 1950s when people began to understand the, the nature of uh, how memory depended on the brain. So when Brenda Milner made her a discovery with uh, William Scoville that uh, memory, being able to remember what had happened in the past essentially in terms of per personal experience, was really strongly dependent on the hippocampus when she studied uh, patient HM and who had had bilateral hippocampal removal in the service of, of curing his epilepsy. She noticed that he was amnesic. He couldn't remember what had happened to him in the past. But interestingly, in subsequent experiments uh, by her and various other colleagues, it was realized that there were many areas of preservation of memory in this kind of amnesic patient. So indeed, he could remember semantic facts about the world. He found it difficult to learn new ones, but he could remember the ones he already knew. He could learn new tasks like uh, riding a bicycle, although that wasn't the one they, they taught him. They taught him to do some uh, tracing of shapes when looking in the mirror and this kind of thing. And he was able to do uh, that kind of learning. And also his short-term memory seemed to be fine. So in the classic neuropsychological tests that you would give to a patient, like remembering a sequence of numbers in order, like a new telephone number, his performance was fine. So he could remember lists of uh, uh, numbers or, or, or words in order in immediate memory. If you test him immediately afterwards, then he's fine. So it seems that this sort of short-term memory is different to the general memory or long-term memory where he can't remember what's happened to him in the days and weeks and, and indeed months and years previous. And he could also remember, for example, to tap a sequence of locations on, on some blocks in order if tested immediately. So his short-term memory for sequences of locations or sequences of words or sounds or, or numbers uh, tested immediately uh, seemed to be fine. So a distinction was clearly present between long-term memory for what's happened to you, which does depend on the hippocampus, and short-term memory over you know, a small number of seconds, if I t ask you something and test, test you immediately afterwards, seems to not depend on the hippocampus and be preserved in the classic amnesic patients that have uh, hippocampal damage. And so uh, what, what we've learned from this is that there are uh, probably neocortical, perhaps basal ganglia mechanisms, parts of the brain outside of the hippocampus, which can support for a very short time certain kinds of information, like a sequence of numbers or a sequence of locations uh, or a sequence of actions to tap. And yet, uh, more recently, it's become clear that there are also some kinds of information which, even for a short period of time, uh, you can't remember them if you don't have a hippocampus. And so the distinction between short-term memory and long-term memory as uh, originally made, you know, here's a box that involves the hippocampal system in which we put our long-term memories for long-term storage, and then here's another box which, which is somewhere else in the brain, perhaps in parietal and prefrontal areas, for which we can store things for a short period of time. That story is becoming a little bit more mixed now. So um, although it was always, from the earliest experiments, it was clear that um, there's an element of active rehearsal, if you like, in remembering a sequence of, of numbers or a sequence of actions. And if we give an intervening task, um, often referred to as Brown-Peterson task, after psychologists who first tried putting an intervening task before asking for recall, then that short-term memory can be disrupted and performance can be uh, very poor, particularly in an amnesic patient who is not allowed to actively rehearse or to keep this um, information online in some way. If there's an intervening task and then they have to think back to what happened, then their memory is very, is very bad. And so um, a popular idea is that there are parts of the brain, perhaps loops between prefrontal and parietal cortex that enable activity to stay active and not require storing via long-term changes in uh, electrical connection strengths between neurons as we think long-term memory is stored uh, in the hippocampal system that can keep active memory alive for some, some number of seconds. And this, this would be classic short-term memory. But for example, if um, I ask you to remember something 
whose representation itself seems to depend uh, on this hippocampal system that does, uh, is required for long-term memory, like the topographical layout of a scene or a bunch of objects uh, in locations where you have to remember both what the object is and what the location is. It seems that the brain requires some of this hippocampal system to actually represent that information in, a, in an efficient way. And even if I show you this scene and ask you to remember it and then test you again uh, within a few seconds, then uh, if you're a patient with hippocampal damage, you won't be able to do that. And so it's not just a question of whether it's short-term period of remembering or long-term period of remembering. It also seems to depend on what it is you have to remember. And so a lot of current um, research is focused on understanding exactly what the differences are, what things you can maintain, if you like, in active memory or working memory for some seconds, even if you don't have a hippocampal or long-term memory system to rely on, and what kinds of things you use this, this long-term memory system for, even over short durations, so that if you don't have that system or if it's damaged in some way, then you see a, an impairment in short-term responding. So the, as I said, the classic distinction between short-term memory and long-term memory really uh, was a distinction between things that you can keep online if I present this information and you can continue to think about it and then you're tested on, on what had happened. Then that would be working memory or active memory or short-term memory. Whereas if I gave you a distractor task so that you were not able to continue thinking about whatever the stimuli were, then to remember what had happened, you would now need long-term memory because you weren't able to keep that, those thoughts currently active. This idea of active memory versus um, long-term memory is also a little bit um, coming under question in terms of what the brain mechanisms are because for a long time it was thought that active memory was actually the information you could represent by the continued activity of the neurons that encode that kind of information. Whereas long-term memory uh, the neurons are active during encoding, perhaps you strengthen electrical connections between these neurons and then that is the long-term memory, which you can come back to days or weeks later by reactivating part of it and having those strengthened connections reactivate the rest of the memory. That simple understanding of active versus uh, long-term memory, is it's not so clear if that is the case in all situations. For example, now people are doing sophisticated functional uh, imaging experiments while people do remember things for short periods of time. It's not clear if those uh, items are being actively maintained or whether perhaps there's something like uh, short-term plasticity in the connections between neurons which is able to store information for short periods of time uh, and not necessarily in an active state in terms of neurons act actively representing that information during this delay period before you're tested. So I think going forward in the field of memory, people are beginning to concentrate a little bit more on the nature of the neural representation of information and the mechanisms by which that can be maintained. So for some examples, like the remembering a sequence of words or digits in order that, uh, that I mentioned before, there clearly are active mechanisms, a little bit like saying the, the sounds to yourself and hearing them and therefore keeping alive that uh, sequence of uh, activity. And the psychologists um, Alan Badley and Graham Hitch uh, worked on a nice model of what they called the phonological loop to, to uh, explain how this information can be kept going uh, for short periods of time and how it's disrupted by an intervening task. And when you start to think about uh, short-term memory, or long-term memory, actually if you think about the mechanisms required, it may turn out that for some stimuli, as I said, uh, spatial scenes, there's not a mechanism, depending on neocortical areas, that can keep this information active. To actually represent it, you do need parts of the brain that are typically associated with long-term memory, like the hippocampus, to represent it in the first place. And maybe there's not a mechanism for keeping that representation active, in the way that there might be for saying some a sequence of sounds to yourself and hearing them and, and thereby almost like sub, sub vocally rehearsing that information may not exist for other kinds of stimuli. And so what we get is a picture where different kinds of things are actually remembered in, in slightly different ways. There seems to be some commonality in that if you have to remember something for a long time, so if you're going to be asked a long time later, which there's no hope that you could keep this information active for that time, then you probably will depend on the hippocampal memory system uh, 
and you know amnesics won't be able to remember that information if it's stuff that you have to actually remember the experience of, of, of seeing before. Whereas the actual mechanisms used for short periods of time or long periods of times may differ uh, they may depend on different parts of the brain, they may depend on the nature of the, of the information that you're trying to remember. And so going forward, I think this uh, focus on, on mechanism uh, beyond, say, a simple storage box for short-term memory or storage box for long-term memory, uh, that's what we're beginning to see. And uh, we would expect to see this understanding giving us advances in, in understanding different kinds of neurological patients who have different kinds of uh, difficulty remembering different kinds of, of things.